What's up all my Ewoks, it's Anna, also known as that Star Wars girl, and today I am going to be talking about Silence of the Lambs, and specifically Clary Starling. Before I get into this article that I'm going to read, because, uh, just so everyone is aware, the guy that has been fucking up Star Trek is now getting his grimy paws onto my favorite book slash movie, because yes, the book is my favorite book, and the movie is my favorite movie. Outside of Star Wars, outside of sci-fi, Silence of the Lambs is my favorite movie. In my very first video ever here on my channel, you can see in the background my painting of Hannibal Lecter. This is the painting now. I finished this painting two years ago. He is my favorite villain of all time. I love Silence of the Lambs. I own every single t-shirt I can get my hands of of Silence of the Lambs. I have every audiobook rendition. I have every book rendition. I even have the freaking death's head moth from the Silence of the Lambs. Yes, I went, I found somebody that sells these, and I bought it, and yes, this was hanging up on my wall in my house, and I took it down specifically for this video. I just want everyone to be aware that yes, while, while I am that Star Wars girl, this is something that is very dear and close to my heart, so I have a lot of strong opinions about it. But, I'm going to go and read this article, and I'm going to break down just how insanely frustrating this is to me. So let's go check this out. Alright everyone, so I have this article pulled up. I'm going to try and attempt uh, to get through this without, you know, physically imploding, but uh, let, let's check this out. Silence of the Lambs sequel series Clarice, set at CBS for Alex Kurtman and Jenny Lummett. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her last name right, so I'll probably just call them Alex and Jenny, but uh, let, let's get into this. Oh. CBS has just closed deals for Clarice, a crime drama series based on the famous Thomas Harris character Clary Starling, which is set after the events of Silence of the Lambs. The project, written and executive produced by Alex Kurtzman and Jenny Lummett, has received a big series commitment. The intention for the project, which has a pilot script written, is to go to series. It uh, will film a pilot before the series order decision is made, but a writer's room has already been set up and there is a lot of enthusiasm for the title. The premise and auspices uh, at the network, that's not a word you see every day, auspices? Uh, needless to see, Clarice will be one of the highest profile roles for a young actress uh, this pilot season. Well, no freaking duh. Every single young aspiring actress is going to want to play Clarice Starling. But the fact that there's enthusiasm for the title, of course, it's Silence of the Lambs. It, you know, swept at the Oscars. People know the name. People know the sinisterness. That is Hannibal Lecter. They know the story. Even if, you know, it's not as, you know, um, what would you say, like mainstream, I guess. And, you know, the, 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 that's kind of why in the beginning of this video, I, I don't, I'm not one of those people, I don't like gatekeeping. If, you know, you're entitled to your opinion, if you love something, you don't have to own all the merchandise. But one of the things that I've found when I meet other people that are very enthusiastic about Silence of the Lambs, it's, it is almost impossible to find merchandise for Silence of the Lambs. That's why whenever I see something from Silence of the Lambs, I buy it. That's why, you know, I decided to start creating stuff for Silence of the Lambs. That's why I did a painting of Hannibal Lecter. That's how, why I have prints of Hannibal Lecter on my Etsy. It's because it's incredibly hard to to find Silence of the Lamb merchandise, and when you do, it's like, Silence of the Lambs fans, you go and you buy it. So yes, it's going to be a very coveted role for whatever actor is going to play it, but when you get a liar like this, Alex Kurtzman, writing it, that's not promising. I'm not enthusiastic about hearing that. Uh, Clarice is produced by MGM, which owns the rights to the movies and CBS Television Studios in association with Kurtzman CBS Studios-based Secret Hideout. Clarice is set in 1993, a year after the events of Silence of the Lambs. The series is a deep dive uh, into the untold personal story of Clarice Starling as she returns uh, to the field to pursue serial murders and sexual predators while navigating the high-stakes political world of Washington, D.C. Okay, so let me explain something about Clarice Starling. When we're first introduced to Clarine, we don't know anything about her. When we do learn stuff about her, it's not things that she is telling us. She's not going and, you know, we're not we're not seeing these things happen. We're being told, Clarice, you're at the top of your class. That's why you're getting this job opportunity. That's why I'm sending you to go see Hannibal Lecter. And it's characters that are bringing this out of her because she's a very closed off person. She's straightforward. She's all about business. And it's, you know, characters like Hannibal Lecter that are peeling, you know, the layers back. So that's how we get to learn about Clarice Starling. It's 
it's not her putting out this information. It's the other characters that will either say things about Clarice, like say, oh, Clarice, you know, you're so smart, this, this, and this, or Clarice, you know, you, the, and it, it's different in the books than in the film, but in the film, you know, we, we really get to see that with Hannibal Lecter and how he brings that out of her, how he gets her to give out information about herself. And we see those flashbacks that happen, which yes, does happen in the book. It's slightly different in the book than in the films, but to go through and say, okay, we're going to do a sequel to Silence of the Lambs. All right. Well, if you read the books, which I highly doubt these people did, they probably just read the Smark Notes version on it, or they've read an article about the books, and they never actually read it. They didn't take the time to read it. They haven't read it multiple times. All right. So something about that happens in the books is, yes, one of the greatest things about Clary Starling is that she is a very strong, not Mary Sue woman. She never, you know, get things don't just get handed to her. This job opportunity uh, with Hannibal Lecter, the only reason she got that opportunity, because she showed that she was up to the challenge. She questioned the authority. And guess what? She provided results. She was one of the top in her class. She, you know, was, she didn't have money. She couldn't afford this. She worked through scholarships. She had what was required of the job. She, you know, had a summer where she was, you know, um, what, what is it called? A, it's a fellowship. A, I, I would say internship, but, you know, it's different in the medical field. A fellowship working, you know, in psychology. So that's how she was able to get the opportunity to work with Hannibal Lecter. If she didn't have that, if she didn't work her ass off trying to become a fellow to get into the, you know, FBI at Quantico and, you know, get into the training program to become an FBI agent, she wouldn't have that opportunity to go and interrogate Lecter. Crawford would have picked somebody else, but no, he picked her because she was qualified for it, because she put time, energy, and effort into it, because she's not a Mary Sue. She she works for everything that she gets. And then, again, she's a very closed off person. It's very natural for people to, you know, hide their demons and to not want to talk about things. And this is a very common thing within, you know, adults in, you know, modern day society, actually throughout the history of time, is we, you know, sometimes you don't want to deal with things and you suppress that. And then when it is brought forth, you kind of have that break. You have that, you know, either epiphany moment or, you know, the you know, kind of a mental breakdown kind of thing. And we see how Hannibal Lecter brings that out in her. And that's why we have, you know, are the lambs still screaming, Clarice? You have that moment, that scene, which was supposed to be a flashback scene in Silence the Lambs, where Clarice goes. She goes to Tennessee. She sees Hannibal Lecter in his cage right before he, you know, escapes. And they have that moment where he's just like, tell me what happened, Clarice. You know, why were the, were the lambs screaming? They were, you know, butchering the spring lambs and they have that moment where she talks about that and you know that's why the book that's why the movie is called the silence of the limbs and it's that moment that you know got them the oscars that scene in the movie was you know i feel like once you see that scene you're never going to forget it and that's because thomas harris actually had that life experience where he worked you know he that's what he did he worked with these people he wrote about it and he got to interview police officers police women he got to interview psycho serial killers and get both sides of the story and that's why when he wrote these characters they are based on real life characters you can go and listen to uh him talk about the doctor that he went and interviewed uh, about a different psycho serial killer and how he didn't know that this man was a serial killer until one of the guards at the hospital or excuse me uh one of the guards at the prison told him that yeah the guy is a normal do like when he's a doctor and he's when he's working and he's working on patients he's a doctor but on his off time you know he's a serial killer that's why he's you know the hospital doctor but he's you know a prisoner here at the hospital and he thomas harris didn't know that and that's the person that inspired hannibal lecter and there's so many layers to each one of these characters and that's why it's so brilliant that's why the story will stand the test of time but then you got this idiot alex kurtzman who completely lies when he does interviews and says oh you know about star trek about star trek discovery and for those of you that aren't aware when i watched star trek discovery i was working on the collection of paintings i had a show to do and you know i was gonna do this big convention it was my first time i had to get 12 paintings done i had star trek discovery playing in the background i was barely paying attention to it and then you know i was like oh it's not that bad and then when i stopped painting and i went and i watched it and i was like okay i really need to pay attention because you know mecaran has been yelling at me and so i was like i gotta pay attention i gotta see what this is and i turned it off because that was complete bullshit how do you fuck up mirror mirror how do you fuck up the klingons w were you gonna tell me that this dude is a human but he's actually klingon and he's like morphine and it, it doesn't make sense and then i was on a, a live stream the other night on midnight sedge after dark and you know mecca was there tom was there rob was there anti trekker was there and they were just telling me these horror stories of what Star Trek has become, and it's all because of this fucking idiot.
And it's like, get your grimy paws off of Star Trek. And he says, oh, well, like, when, when I'm working on Star Trek, I really like to tell a story about, you know, strong women. So now he's got his grimy paws on Clary Starling, which is a character I 100% guarantee he knows absolutely nothing about, aside from the fact that, oh, it's, it's a leading lady in a movie. It's, you know, female empowerment. Yeah, you know what was fucking empowering about Clary Starling? Is, yeah, she was in a patriarchal, you know, job society type thing. Patriarchy, okay, cool. But guess what? She shows that she is the best at what she can do, and she doesn't have to, you know, deface men to do it. She doesn't have to go, well, I am women, you must, you know, respect me because I am women. No, she proves herself. She goes out and does it. She does the thing that no man can do, and that was what was fucking empowering about Clary Starling. And she doesn't rub it in anyone's face. She thanks Crawford, even though, you know, there was that sexual tension. It was more, it was a lot more so in the movie than it was in the book. They played that up really, you know, well in the movie than in the book. And, you know, especially with the little stuff between Hannibal Lecter and the book, he's dealing with his wife and, you know, how his wife is, you know, on her deathbed, basically. And, you know, they, he talks about how she's attractive, but he's, you know, if he was younger, he'd be interested. But because he's older and, you know, he's dealing with, you know, his wife that's, you know, she does eventually pass away in the book. It's it's very, very different, but I think the way that they played it up cinematically made sense. There's also a lot of things that are very different in the book. Like, in the movie, she was an only child, and her mother passed away when she was little, and her, when her father died, she lost her entire world. Whereas in the novels, she had siblings. She had a lot of siblings. She was the oldest sibling. Her mother was still alive. And, you know, it, it's very different. But guess what? I bet you this idiot doesn't know any of that. And so they're going to go tell silent the, a sequel of what's happening a year after. Well, guess what? What, what are you going to do? Okay, you're, so you're going to go through her life? One of the greatest things about Hannibal, and I have a lot of problems with the novel Hannibal and with the movie Hannibal. And, you know, it's taken me years to come to terms with it. But in the novel, the reason why it takes to place 10 years later is because you have to show that progression. You, it, it needed to be that way to show how her career has advanced or not. And you get to see that difference between how she was when she graduated from the FBI Academy and became an FBI agent to 10 years later when she's been in her career, the hardships that she's faced within the patriarchy. And yet, if you're sensitive about the word patriarchy, you have to understand that the way that they did this, the way that they showed Clary Starling's story, it's not one that's meant to be offensive towards men. And I think that people don't understand when, I, I feel like originally when they wanted to bring about the, you know, the feminist movement, which has gotten, you know, completely tarnished now and it's like it, it I, as a woman it's offensive to be considered a feminist because of how fucking psycho these women are and it, i don't understand why it's a big thing as you know if you want to say you let let's boost female empowerment but by doing that bashing on men that's not how you do it that's not what clarice was doing in the movie in the novel she her goal isn't to you know bring down men except unless they're psycho serial killers and she's going to go you know kill them or you know to take them into custody because they're murdering women that that that's understandable you can go and and take down the psycho serial killer. That makes sense. But, in, you know, just a normal coworker, she, her goal isn't to, you know, deface them and bring them down. No, her goal is to win by example, by to, by leading, by doing the best that she can do in every situation. That's one of the greatest things about Clarice Starling. And that's one thing that I think is lost in feminism. And that's why I think that she's a perfect example of what a strong female character is. Is because if you become strong by improving yourself and doing the best that you can every single time without bashing on somebody just based on your gender, that I think is successful. But what they're doing now is we have to show that women are the best. We have to show that women are the strongest. And we have to make men look like little pussy shits. And that's not the way to do things. That's not what happened in the movie. That's not what happened in the novel. Clarice Starling did what she did because she was the best at what she did and because she was the only one that could go into the belly of the beast twice, face off two psychopaths, and come out the victor each time. No one else could do that but Clarice Starling. That's why she was the hero of that movie, why she was the hero of that book. And this guy, I guarantee fucking it doesn't understand that. And I'm showing a year after. Okay, so a year after, what what's she gonna be doing? Her first couple jobs? Yeah, Hannibal Lecter. And they, I think I haven't uh, gotten to that part yet. Uh, let, let's see. I there. I, I saw it, but I hadn't read it out loud. Uh, I hear the character Hannibal Lecter is not expected to be part of the series. Well, no fucking shit, because that's he's off hiding. He's getting you know modifications to his body. He's getting. And this isn't in the movie. It's in the book. In the book, Hannibal Lecter has a sixth finger. He's getting. He's in Brazil, getting that finger removed. And then he's off in Europe. You know building up his, you know, alter identities, and he's, you know, rebuilding himself. He's enjoying the luxuries that he was denied during his time when he was in prison. That's why when you read Hannibal, that's when Hannibal Lecter comes back into Clarice's life, and she's at a 
pivotal point in her career. That's why it is set 10 years in the future. If these fuckers actually read the book, they would understand that. But guess what? I guarantee you they fucking didn't. Or else we wouldn't be having this conversation. This article wouldn't be written. After more than 20 years of silence, we're privileged to give a voice to one of America's most enduring heroes, Clary Starling. I like how they spelled it differently. So right here, it's Clary Starling with an A. And then up here, uh, it's Clary Starling with an E. Come on, Nellie. Come on, Nellie. It really... <laughs> said Kersman and Lummet. Uh, Clarice's bravery and complexity have always lit the way, even as her personal story remained in the dark. That's one of the greatest things about her, is that you're peeling back the layers. It's not up in your face. Hello, I'm Clarice Starling. I had a really rough childhood, and now I'm gonna do this, this, and this, and I'm gonna be, you know, the leader for women, and I'm gonna be women empowerment. No. That's one of the greatest things about Clarice, is that she... She's not one of those in-your-face narcissists. She's very, you know, calculated. She's, you know, very critical of herself. And even with, it's, again, it's, it's different in the book than it's in the movie. But in the book, she's constantly talking to herself. She's constantly doubting herself. You have that inner monologue. And she's, you know, kind of telling herself, like, c to, you know, get herself pent up. Like, yes, I'm in a serial killer's house. The lights are off. Oh, my God, how am I going to survive? You, you got to stay focused. You got to stay pumped. Even when she's facing off certain characters and she's thinking, she's like, you, you can hear feel the anger within her inner monologue and it's stuff that she doesn't let out because she's a very closed off secretive person and she's like that for a reason so when you have you know the nemesis character the villain like which is Hannibal Lecter and he's the one that's peeling back these layers of her because she has to she wouldn't share this information with anyone else the only reason she's giving this information is because another human's life depends on her you know basically selling her soul to this serial killer, to this mass murderer, to this villain, which is Hannibal Lecter. If that's not intriguing, if that's not a strong female character, I don't know what is. But the, these people, I guarantee you, don't understand that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Clarice's bravery and complexity have always lit uh, the way, even in her personal story remained in the dark. But her hers is a very... Uh, very story we need today. Her struggle, her resilience, her victory, her time is now and always. Okay, so now I they're going to use Clarice because I, I'm going to let you guys know right now. I've done my research on these people. This dude, I don't know how he still gets work. If you go look at his resume, oh, okay, it's like you have one success. You've got the proposal. Congratulations. You were an executive producer on the proposal. Everything else, I would be embarrassed. I would not have that on my resume. You can go look him up on IMDb. Oh, you, you did Transformers? Oh, you did the, the Mummy movie with Tom Cruise? All right, you, you did Hercules and Xena back in the day, which I, I do. I, I like those shows. So, uh, but how much work did you actually do on that dude? Were you like Kathleen Kennedy? Were you just a glorified secretary? But honestly, you go look at this guy's resume, it's like, how the fuck do you have work? How? Who the hell would hire you? You're bleeding money. You have alienated the Star Trek fans. You go watch any interview that this guy does about Star Trek, it's so obvious how he's just spewing lies. He's like, well, I want to stay true to the lore, and if you mess with the lore, the fans are going to get, their fans are going to get mad, so I'm not going to mess with the lore. What does he do? Oh, let's fuck the lore up. Let's just fuck everything up. Oh, you, you like that? Oh, guess what? I'm going to fucking ruin it. I'm going to ruin your childhood. I'm going to ruin everything that you cared about in Star Trek. I'm just going to, you know, light it on fire. I'm gonna piss all over it and if you don't like it you're a misogynistic sexist man baby and it's like well fuck you fuck you then and now you're gonna use clary starling and you know th this is the critical thing uh high stakes political world of washington dc that's what they're gonna do for clary starling they're 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 going to have her focus on the politics. They're not going to have her focus on actually solving murders and going after serial killers. And, you know, getting in, the, the, the way Hannibal starts off is her after she's been uh, going through this whole thing about trying to get this, you know, drug lord crime boss. And then, you know, if you watch the movie, you know what happens. If you read the book, you know what happens. I'm not going to get too much into that. But they're just going to use her as a ploy. They're going to turn her into a Mary Sue. And they're going to use the whole... And I don't care what side of the political spectrum you're on. They're going to use her for their own political, you know, narrative. And we all know what that is. And that that's not the point of Clarice. That, that's not the point of the novel. That That's... That's not what the character was about. To her core, what she wanted to do was she wanted to do good. And she wanted to save people. And she wanted to make the world a better place. And then... We all know what happens. And I will get into that if uh, this calls for it, but l let's keep reading this article. Uh, Secret Hideouts, Heather Caden, uh, will always serve as an executive producer alongside Kurtzman and Limit. The company's Aaron Bears will, uh, co uh, will be co-executive producer. Mm. 
excuse me, uh, the creative auspices, why are they using this word again? That's honestly, not a lot of people know what this word is. It's a very older, or, or, <laughs> very older word. Uh, th this isn't a very common word, I should say. And the fact that you're going to use it twice, it's like, come on, you already spelled Clarice's name wrong. And, you know, you add it in your article twice. Now you have this word in your article twice. It's like, if you want to use like a word of the day, you vary it up a little bit. Uh, auspices have uh, been working on the project for a while while waiting for the lengthy, complicated negotiations with CBS TV studios, MGM, and other right uh, holders to close. I hear they finally closed after midnight this morning. MGM, please, for the love that all is, the, for the love of the freaking world, for the love of everyone's sanity, unsign it, undo it, get their, get, take it away from their grimy paws because they are going to fuck up Clary Starling. They're going to fuck it all. Watch, they're probably going to bring, they're going to say, oh, we're not going to bring Hannibal Lecter back, and then they're going to bring him back. And it's like, no, no, one of the greatest things is that he doesn't come back until Hannibal, and then the thing happens with the thing, and then the thing, and then the thing that caused a lot of controversy, but it makes sense, and it's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, my soul, my soul, they're going to fuck it up, and oh my god. Told you guys I didn't want to implode, but let me finish. Let me finish this. Oh. MGF. MGM previously teamed up with Lifetime in uh, 2012 to develop Clarice a TV series uh, that was to follow the exploits of young Clarice Starling soon after she graduates from the FBI Academy. That project did not go forward. I'm pretty sure there was a good reason why. I don't know why you would go forward with these people. That means that there was someone worse working on this. There was someone worse than Kurtzman. That's pretty fucking hard to do. Uh, as originally envisioned by Harris, Clarice grew up in West Virginia until she was 10. Then her father, and a police officer, was shot. She moves to her uncle's farm in Montana. Okay, this person that's writing the article didn't even read the book. It's her mother's cousin. That's not her uncle. So th that's how much in, uh, the person that is writing this article doesn't know shit about Silence of the Lambs. D probably has never watched the movie and has never read the book. That's lovely. That that's real uh, encouraging. That that's you know the check mark to you. Great for you. Uh, you have really great sources. Apparently, you don't know how to use Google, or you. I mean, come come on, really. But later, runs away and winds up in an orphanage after college. She applies to the FBI Academy. The Silence of the Lambs was published in 1988, and the movie adaption hit theaters in 1991. Uh, directed by Jonathan Dim, uh, I can never say his last name right, Jonathan Dimmy, and uh, starring Jodie Foster as Clarice, it swept the top categories in the 64th Academy Award, uh, including Best Picture and Best Actress for Jodie Foster. Uh, uh, Foster declined to reprise the role in 2001's Hannibal. I like how they don't give Anthony Hopkins, you know, the been for the doubt either you, you do realize anthony hopkins won the oscar right anthony hopkins freaking won i like how they leave out best the best actor but they left out hannibal lecter are you fucking kidding me uh, Foster d declined to reprise the role in 2001's Hannibal based on Harris's 1999 novel, which was set 10 years uh, after Silence of the Lambs. Julianne Moore took over as the character in the movie directed by Ridley Scott. I wasn't too happy with that movie. That movie is uh, pretty infuriating if you actually are a fan of the novel. Uh, writing partners Kurtzman and Lamette are co-creators and co-showrunners of the drama series Man Who Fell to Earth based on the Walter Travis novel and the cult classic 1976 film star David Bowie. Now, for those of you that aren't aware, I'm a huge David Bowie fan. David Bowie is someone that it was a part of my heart and soul, and when he died, I didn't get out of bed. Well, I, I went on a very long walk in San Francisco, and, you know, just my, my heart just broke, and then I didn't get out of bed for a while. And, you know, it's something that still is, you know, with me. I mean, people talk about it all the time. I have, you know, the labyrinth thing, and it's something that's very special to me, and, you know, they're going to fuck this up, too. And it's, like, like I said, it's, it's something that I feel like these people just, they went into my head, they found everything that I loved, and they're like, hey, Anna, you know, your life isn't going too great, let's fuck it up more, let's take everything that you loved, everything that was your escape from the real life world, and let's fuck it up, let's tear it to shreds. And I fucking hate it. It, it, there's, there's no silver lining, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Lumet also is an executive producer on a uh, Kurtzman-led CBS All Access series, Star Trek Discovery. I wouldn't brag about that. I wouldn't brag about that. And consulting producer of Star Trek Picard, uh, author of the short Trek Runaway with Kurtzman. Additionally, she wrote a 2017 CBS pilot produced by uh, Secret Hideout. Kurtzman and Secret Hideout are at, are at the hem of the growing Star Trek universe. 
I wouldn't brag about that. On CBS All Access, including the flagship Star Trek Discovery, on the upcoming Star Trek Picard featuring Patrick Stewart reprising his iconic role. He is also an executive producer on CBS Hawaii Five-0. Uh, Candid uh, serves as executive producer on Star Trek projects and is the president of television at Secret Hideout. Well, that was a major headache, and uh, it doesn't look like it's going to get any better. It just it just looks like everything's going to get worse, especially with these people that they're getting their grimy hands all over everything that I love. First, I watched Star Trek get destroyed. Or, excuse me. I First, I watched Star Wars get destroyed. Then, I watched Star Trek get destroyed. And now, they're going into Silence of the Lambs? Are you kidding me? Okay, it's one thing to piss off Star Wars fans. It's one thing to piss off Star Trek fans, because then they can use the excuse, Oh, well, you're just a nerd. You just live in your mom's basement. And it's like, no have been getting hell since the beginning of freaking time. We're used to it. We can take it. But now, they're moving into like the horror genre. And you know, I've been to Star Wars conventions. I've been to Star Trek conventions. And guess what? I exhibit my artwork and you know, I have a booth at a horror convention. I'm gonna tell you right now, those are not the fans you want to piss off because those people are fucking scary. Alex Kurtman does not know what he's getting into. None of these people, if they're gonna turn Clary Starling into, you know, their own political agenda-driven Mary Sue, it's going to backfire on them epically. These are not the people you want to piss off, and I am definitely not the type of person you want to piss off. But the fact that they're getting their grimy hands all over something that I love, something that has been a part of me since the moment I saw it, since the moment I read it, it is absolutely infuriating. I'm sorry that I know this video is already long enough already. I'm probably going to be doing more videos on this because this is something that I'm very, very passionate about. So everyone, uh, I, I'm sorry that I had to bring this into your life. Uh, I'm sorry if you were not aware about it, that this is the way you had to find out. But anyway, guys, uh, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, that's okay too. Go ahead and leave me a comment. It'll really help me out and my channel out and the algorithm since YouTube's making all these ridiculous changes that's, you know, being a pain in the ass to my channel and, you know, other people's channels. And uh, yeah, so until next time, everyone, have a great rest of your day and may the force be with you because we are really, really, really going to need it. Bye, everyone.